All right, good afternoon and welcome. How is everybody today? Yeah? Good. So my name is Christine Crispin, and I'm the Director of Admissions for UC Irvine School of Medicine. So I am part of the group that will uh, help manage the process of applications for medical school for Irvine. So tell me, unfortunately you're here to talk about what happens when you don't get into medical school, and it's not the happiest of subjects that I get to talk about, but hopefully we can you're just here to get more information as opposed to having not been a successful applicant. So tell me, who has, is currently or has applied to medical school? Oh, a few of you. Currently? Are you guys all current applicants? You were an unsuccessful applicant? You were an unsuccessful applicant? And you're a current? You were unsuccessful. Oh, I was hoping there weren't anybody that was unsuccessful and you're just trying to get information. Okay. So we're going to talk about what it is to do, and, and through this talk, those of you who have not applied yet, what you're hopefully going to learn is what to do when you apply. You're going to get the information that you need, because there's a lot of overlap between the admissions process and this talk, because really it all is the same information. We all still want the same, the same thing from you. And please, as we're going through this, ask questions along the way. Don't, you don't have to wait till the end, although I do have time at the end to answer questions. Make sure you get them answered when we're talking about a topic. So you're looking at your application. It's April. You're realizing that you've had no interviews and you've had a few secondaries and you've gotten your few rejections and you're very depressed and I'm depressed for you. And you're thinking, okay, I applied early. I have a good GPA, I have a good MCAT, you know, I've done all those things, I have good clinical experiences, I have good research, I've done community service, I've done extracurricular, I've worked, I've done all these things and I have a really good application, yet I didn't get in. What happened? What happened? So there's so many answers to that question. Luckily I've only got 45 minutes or I would bore you to death. The thing about that you have to realize, there are so many things that go into our decision-making process. I wish that I could wave a wand and start just picking people out of the group here and say, you're in, you're in, you're not, you are, you're not. And it'd be so easy and be done. It just doesn't ever work that way. Everybody has a lens with which they view your applicant, application. So we have admissions committee members who are faculty who have a strong component in, cl in clinical work. We have researchers who are basic scientists who believe research is the most important thing on your application. And we have students who are much harder than anybody else on the panel. So <laughs> everybody has a lens with which they view your application. And one of the things you have to realize, it is a human process. We receive about 6,000 applications a year, give or take, and every one of those applications will get a human eye. So it is looked at multiple times by the admissions committee and the staff because we want to make sure that we don't overlook somebody that should have been admitted. We do. We reject many people. But the, we still have a human process. And our dean loves to talk about dropping a little fairy dust on the process and hoping we get it right. We're not always right. There are good people who get rejected. We have a class size of 104. When you have 6,000 applications and 104 spots, a whole lot of people are rejected in that way. So when you have a process of humans judging humans, mistakes could happen. And we do our best to make sure that we pick out the jewels and the gems and just hope the best comes through for the class. And at the end of the day, if you go back to the first slide we just had and you applied early and you've got the academics and you've got the clinical experience and the research experience and everything else, and you didn't get in, sometimes you just got in, didn't get in because we didn't have a spot. That maybe we read this, this admissions committee member read this application and another member read your application and they went left instead of right. And honest to God, sometimes that's how it works. So what is it can you do to help mitigate this? So before we get into what you can do, let's talk about what we do when we review your application. We do a holistic review, and I have no doubt that over this weekend you've heard the phrase holistic review a thousand and one times. So now it's a thousand and two, and we do look at everything on your application. There are plenty of applicants who have super strong academics and nothing else, and then there are applicants who have activities and wonderful application and not so strong academics. 
So we look at all of those. But you do have to have the foundational academics. There's no way around it. Generally, a strong application doesn't mitigate weaker um, academics. It just doesn't do that. We have to feel confident that when we matriculate you into the program that you're going to be able to manage the curriculum, manage the courses, and do well. We don't want to bring you in, have you paying uh, $12,000 a quarter to fail out in your first quarter. There's no refunds. I don't know if you've heard that before, but there's no refunds. So we want to make sure that we feel confident that you can manage the curriculum. So academics are important. Irvine's average GPA is 367. Our average MCAT's 32. So we're going to talk a lot more about post back and academics and stuff, but if you're sitting here and you know that your academics are significantly below that range, that might be something you think about. And then there's activities. Activities are very important to us. We don't want an empty, smart person that's just going to come to class, study, and go home. The culture of Irvine is very much a community culture. We do give back to our community. Is anybody from, uh, uh, many of you, who is from Southern California? So you guys are probably familiar with the Irvine area, and you're thinking, how are we giving back to the community? We live in a very wealthy community in Irvine. It's a very nice community, and the further south you go, the wealthier it gets. However, if you go about 10 minutes north of us, you get into Santa Ana and other communities that maybe aren't so blessed and comfortable as Irvine is. So we actually have clinics in Santa Ana. We have a um, outreach clinic. We have a clinic for homeless people. Because Orange County does have a strong underserved population, and it's very important to us as a university, which is the primary academic medical center in Orange County, to give back to that community. So when we bring in applicants who, don't, who haven't demonstrated community service, clinical experience, and research experience in their undergrad, we kind of tend to believe they're probably not going to do that in medical school. And because that is so tremendously important to us, we're going to look for applicants who have those features. Research. Does anybody know why we want research? I ask this question of every presentation I do, I try to get why people think we want research. Anybody? Have an idea. Yes, sir. Um, problem, solving. problem solving is good. What else? Here and then here. Working on a project and getting results mm -hmm. over a long period. Good. Exposure to new ideas. Good. Science community. Analytical good. thinking. What's that? Analytical thinking. Analytical thinking. All those are great answers. We want you to understand the research process from A to Z. And you're going to understand that the process from A to Z also is mishaps and failures, and you don't solve the thing you're trying to solve. But there's also another important factor um, for research for us that we want you to understand, is you're going to be researching some very complex protein with lots of letters and numbers and capital and lowercase letters, of which I have no idea what they are. And you're going to learn a lot about that protein. And you're going to be able to dissect it and know what it does and know what it doesn't do and know the pathologies that go with that protein. But then you're going to come and you're going to sit in an office with me who has a counseling background. And I could sit and talk about counseling theories all day long, but I couldn't tell you about that protein that does something. And I'm going to have an illness. And you're going to say, okay, Christine, this is what you have. And this is what we need to do to mitigate that. And if you start talking to me about a protein that has a pathway to this and that, I'm going to look at you like I'm stupid. You have to explain those complex um, situations in a way that I'm going to understand it. You're going to have patients who maybe have a high school diploma, who maybe have English as a second language, who probably have English as a second language, who don't feel comfortable questioning their doctors. Like if my doctor says, you have X, I'm going to say, what is that? I'm going to go home and look that up on the internet. I have physicians that I work with. I can say, what does this mean to me? What does that mean to me? I, had, I was sick for a week, and my, doc, my supervisor, my dean, she called me and listed like 12 pneumonias that she thought I had. I have resources that I can find those types of things. Not everybody does. So you, as that physician, needs to be able to explain that in a way that me, who has no idea what these things mean, who I changed my major to avoid calculus, I did. <laughs> you have to make sure I understand that. So it's very, very important to us that you have these activities and these experiences because those make you, make you better clinicians. Why do we want clinical experiences? Yes, ma'am. So that we know 
into. That you know what you're getting into. God, yes. Anybody else? Just remember, med school is about $150,000 and there's no money back. To get experience talking to the community. To get experience talking to the community, absolutely. Again. Sure that's the type of environment you want to work in. Yes. You don't want to get to your third year of medical school, the fun years of medical school. You've gone through the boards and biochem and pathology and you've learned all these things. And then you're going to find out, I don't like sick people. Such a bad combination of life right now. So definitely, we want you to have these experiences. Community service, we're very community oriented. We want you to come in having done that. So we look at every one of those things. Who in here has a job? Quite a few of you. So now you've got classes full time. You're probably working at least 20 hours a week, if not more, because probably you want to eat and have a place to live. Um, now we're saying, but I also want you to do research. And I also want you to have clinical experiences. And I also want, and I also want, and I also want. And there's a whole list of things that I want. Where do you find the time? So the fact that you're working, you should probably make sure that's included on your application as well. It's very important for us to know that. You know, it's part of who you are. And everyone in here has an individual story that they're going to share with us. And so make sure we get the whole story, not just picking and choosing because you think it looks better because this is in the medical field and this isn't. I have plenty of people who've worked at Starbucks and they've waited tables and they were servers and hostesses and various things. You got to eat, you got to support your life. I mean, all of those things come into play and that's all a part of who you are. Questions before I move on? So you haven't gotten in. So now what I want you to do is I want you to do a self-assessment of your application. Be honest with yourself. This is not the time to lie to yourself and think, oh, okay, it's all good, it's fine. No, you really need to be honest with yourself. Who, what's your application say? Do you have the academics? Do you have, you know, do you have a well-balanced, solid application? Trust me when I say I'd rather see somebody with an application with a GPA of 3536 three, and solid, and solid activities than a 4.0 and nothing. So have a, well, a really well-balanced application. Is there anything missing? Anything at all? There's one thing, because inevitably when I talk to applicants and I do, um, I do feedback, uh, they can tell me, well, I only did three months of that. I only did this. I probably could have improved that. You can usually figure it out if you're honest with yourself. So before you're calling anybody, Think about your application and be very honest with yourself. The other question I want to know is when did you apply? Because trust me, if you're applying today, and even though the deadline is still open till November 1st, if you're applying today, we've already done three interviews. I have October 21st is full. November 4th is almost full. November 22nd is almost full. And now we're at half of our interview slots have gone. Because if you applied today, I won't get your application until November or December from AMCAS. You're going to get a secondary. That's another 30 days. Now it's January. Oh my God, we have maybe like 50 spots available for interview. So think about when you apply. Now when you're going through this process, for those of you who have not applied, think about the timing. You don't have to apply to medical school because you're a junior in college and you want to go right away. Timing is everything, so don't think about all that. So if you applied super late, maybe the reason you didn't get in is because you applied super late and we just ran out of spots. Where did you apply? How many plan to apply in schools in California? Of course you do. You want to stay in California. How many plan, are planning to apply in schools outside of California? You have to. California has a very finite number of spots. We, I'm sure everybody sitting here is a fabulous applicant, and you won't get into all the California schools. It's just not possible. We don't have enough spots available. So 15 to 20 schools at minimum is where you want to apply. And I want you to choose far and wide. So you can hit the California ones. That's great. Um, but then the other half that you apply to, look at their out-of-state acceptance rate if it's a state school. Can you live in this state? Because let's face it, I would never apply to some place in Vermont or Maine or some place where it snows way too much. That's not for me. I'd go south. Florida, humidity. I'd rather have humidity than snow. Of course, you got hurricanes. But you got to you know, you got to think about all of those things. Where do you want to live? Where can you see yourself for four years? I cannot tell you how many people I talk to 
who only hit the California schools. Well, no wonder you didn't get in. You're not going to get in. It's the numbers and odds are against you. So make sure you really think about when and where you're applying. And then you should know this. What areas are your weakest on your application? That's what you're going to fix. So after you've done your own thought and thinking through, you're going to try to talk to some admissions advisors. Um, we take at Irvine, we do take feedback appointments for applicants after they've been fully rejected from us. We don't advise applicants who are in the current in the process. Um, and we usually take appointments between January and June. We just don't have time in the other part of the year. So we do feedback and we'll review it and generally we're going to talk about one of the areas we're going to talk about in a couple of slides. What is it you can do to improve your application? If you can speak to multiple admissions offices at different schools, the more opinions you get the better, but whenever I've talked to applicants who have been afforded the opportunity to talk to other admissions offices, generally all you're doing is confirming what the other one says. But it's nice to get other opinions because remember, different schools put different emphasis on things. So make sure that you really try to hit um, what they want so you can fix that part of your application. Who has a pre-health advisor, um, the pre-health program? So I know Davis has them, various schools have them. That might be a person you want to talk with as well. They understand what the admissions process is. They can be honest with you. Um, what is their advice? But even more so is I want to know what was their advice before you hit submit on that application. Because if you talk to them before you applied and you went through the application process with them, hopefully they said, oh, you're running a risk when your GPA is a 3.2 and you have a 25 MCAT. Oh, no, it's going to be fine because I have two years of this and three years of that and blah, 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 and here we are a year later and you haven't been admitted to medical school. Listen to your advisor because they're very familiar with our programs. We, they, they're the ones, to be honest, they're calling us, and they, if they have a question, I'm the first person they call. Christine. I have a student who da 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 okay, yes, no, whatever, whatever. So ask them because they do know. I know it's hard for you to take their advice and that you would prefer to have it from me, but honestly, they're just as good. So now what? So now we're going to fill in the gaps based on your research. And the first thing, the first gap we came across is your academics. So what do we do with the academics? We have post back programs. So if you need to improve your GPA and the low, if your GPA is hovering at a 3.4 and below, you might consider some sort of post back courses. I know that's 3.4 in, in real world, which is better than my undergraduate GPA, by the way, is fine for most time, for most things. Medical school, it's just super competitive. So you need something a little bit better than that. So I would start thinking about different types of post -back programs. So what kinds are there? Well, you have the undergraduate post -back program, a formalized one. I know like East Bay has one, Davis has one. Um, we have one. I know there's quite a few in the South. Uh, Cal State LA has one. Scripps College has one. So there's different kinds of post -back programs, though, for undergraduate. There's some for career changers. So if you majored in psychology or music or business or whatever, but not a science major, you may think that way. You may go with that for a post -back program. But if you're having academic problems, you're probably going the other way, which is academic enhancement. So you need to take some upper division science courses that's going to help improve your GPA. Now, I am very aware that taking 25, 30, 40 units in the big scheme of things when you've taken already 130, 150 units in undergrad, it's not going to make a huge dent. But the way that we view the GPA is you have your freshman, sophomore, junior, senior years. We'll have a cumulative and then we'll have a post back. So we're going to see all of those GPAs. We're going to see the upward trend, the growth that you've made. We're going to see what your post back GPA is. And trust me when I say you want it to be a 3.9, 3.8, 4.0. If you're going post back, please, God, don't get C's in the post back program because you're really hurting your chances at that point to do that. So when you do post back, you need to dedicate yourself to doing post back and do well. When I advise my own post back students at Irvine, when they get, a couple of them have gotten C's, they get an email from me that says, you need to come talk to me. That's, we don't play with that one anymore. Undergrad, you've made mistakes, that's fine. In post back, you need to fix those mistakes and that's not an acceptable grade. Um, 
So you want to look at post-bac programs. Then there's special master's programs. I know most of you have probably heard of a special master's degree. Georgetown has them, Tufts has them, Drexel has them. So different schools have special master's degrees. And many times what those programs are, are giving you the opportunity to take courses with the medical school, the medical students, and showing that you're capable of managing their curriculum. Um, a lot of times they have you applying at the time you start the program. I think that's the worst thing ever because really I don't see anything about your improvement when you've applied at that point. You want to get some courses under your belt before you apply. You want to show and demonstrate clearly that you've gotten the curriculum under your belt. So that would be my thought is don't apply when you enroll because it really doesn't do you any good. If you got somewhere, again, 3.3, 3, 3, 4, 3, 5 GPA and you feel a special master program will separate you, that's a good time to go. If your GPA is lower than that, I would look at an undergraduate master, uh, post back program. I really would. You want to show that you can manage the curriculum in the upper division bios. And then I get a lot of questions. It's not on here, but I do get a lot of questions about doing another master's program, an MPH, an MBA, blah, 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 blah. What am I going to do to differentiate myself? That doesn't really help your application if you have academic problems, believe it or not. It's nice. It does differentiate you but it doesn't mitigate that problem. So be aware of that. That you got seasoned season. as an undergraduate? It doesn't really, it's not a huge benefit because it's averaged into the application. AMCAS averages everything. I would rather you retake or just take different upper division bio courses. Any other questions? So informal post back program, programs. Not everybody gets admitted to a, oh, go ahead. What about for like physics courses? Would you recommend, like if you got like a, not a great grade in physics, would you recommend retaking it? Or I would only know? recommend retaking that type of a course if it's going to help you with content for the MCAT. Because physics is a huge component on the MCAT. So if you struggled and didn't do well and you don't have a clear understanding of the content, then that's what I would do. Don't retake courses to fix the GPA. Take them for content if you need them. Yes, ma'am. Looking at GPA, do you factor in the rigor of like the curriculum at different universities? If they deem that it's appropriate, we have to honor that. Anybody else? Yeah. After you graduate, if you didn't have great GPA, doing a straight master's degree. Mm -hmm. If you, it depends on what your definition of not great GPA is. Again, if it's three, four, three, five, eh, master's degree is fine, but you may think of a special master's degree. If it's below that, you need a post back. Hmm? So you like um, you got a good GPA, but then in one course you have like a C plus. So is that That's one course, and you have an okay GPA overall? Then it's fine. I wouldn't. I wouldn't sleep over that. All right, so an informal post back program is where you're just kind of taking courses on your own through extension, through your university. You're not in a formalized program. Um, basically, if you feel that you need to do that, maybe you're working and you're trying to just get everything in and you, want, you know you need to take some courses, take some upper division bio courses at undergrad level. MCAT, I'm going to caution you about the MCAT. You, if you have a low MCAT score, obviously you probably want to retake it. However, if you came to my talk this morning, I did put this caveat out there. Taking the MCAT when you're, when you're sitting on a score of 9s and 10s and 11s just to get a 12, a 13, and a 14 is a really bad idea. If you've got a, a solid MCAT, 9s, 10s, 11s are better, um, I wouldn't necessarily think of retaking the MCAT because all you're doing is you're running a huge risk of lowering that score. So really think long and hard about when you decide to retake an MCAT. If that may not be the only problem, you know, that may not be the problem, it could be something else within your application. So be aware of that. Don't, don't think, well, I've got a 30, I should have a 32. If you've got 10s across the board and you've got a 30, that's a fine, that's, that's a solid MCAT. I wouldn't panic over that. Especially, if your GPA is lower and there's other things, you know, you make everything else as stellar as it can be and hold on to that MCAT score. Okay? Yes, ma'am. So if you 
you don't think your GPA is as great, then linear impact score makes a difference? Well, you want to, you would focus on the GPA and not the MCAT. You know what I mean? So a good MCAT's not going to mitigate a, a bad GPA, but it could offset an average GPA. So if you've got a 3.4, 3.5, but like a 32, 33, 35 MCAT, eh, I'd go with that and see what happens. Okay, yeah. So, um, for example, you want to go into like an MD PhD program, which requires a higher MCAT, but if your MCAT currently is above a a 30 but not exactly at like a 34 right now, should you really retake it or? MD PhD programs have different requirements and so if you're reading, if I would not recommend that for an MD program because again you run risks of lowering and studies show that you're, it's not likely you're going to jump from a 30 to a 34, 35, 36. So you run a risk. But if you feel that strongly about it because it's an MD PhD program, MD PhD programs focus a lot on research. I mean, that's their primary focus. So, yes, ma'am. What time do you recommend to start studying for the MCAT and for how long? That is a brilliant question. I think you should take the MCAT. You should give yourself, I'd say, three to six months to study for it. If you could devote, like, a summer to studying for the MCAT without any other courses, all the better. considering on studying it for this year while I'm taking my classes. You can but study for it. I would not do that until you get the courses under your belt. Get your chemistry, physics, biology courses under your belt. There's no point because you don't have the content foundation yet. So your junior year, probably January, February of your junior year is the earliest I would begin thinking about it. That's correct. Mm -hmm. And then you study in the way that is best for you. If you like the courses, the prep courses, blah, 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 fantastic. If you have the discipline to study without those courses, even better. So whatever is best for you is the way you should do it. Okay. Any other questions before I move on? Yes, ma'am. When you're ready. And you're like, okay, really? <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. You take it, you've studied for it, you've got the foundational courses, you've taken some um, prep course, the, the practice exams, and you're scoring well on those, that's when you take it. So you don't take, there's no arbitrary day to take it. I, I lean conservatively in, in the application process when I advise people. So what I mean by that is you take the MCAT, you get a score back, you know what your score is, you have your GPA, you have everything in hand before you apply. The same type of thing with the MCAT. Take it when you know you're confident that you're going to do well on it. If that's the summer of your junior, at the end of your junior year, fantastic. If it's not till later, that's okay. The worry that people have is you're taking it, if you take it the first time, you never take it just to see what your score is. My God, please don't do that because that score records and then we're going to get that score. And then you got to take it again because that score wasn't a great score because it was just a trial. You have practice exams. The AAMC offers practice exams. Take those exams, take them in a real test setting like situation and get those scores. The AAMC scores, what we have found, like different Kaplan, Princeton Review, they all have different types of practice exams. We actually like the AAMC practice exams because it tends to be a more real um, score for where you are. So what our postbacks we've seen that they've done very well in a test prep exam but not so well in the AAMC exams. We actually really focus on what the AAMC prep exams are so we can know how to advise them. So that was a total non-answer but there you go. Back here and then I'll come up. Um, you take the MCAT twice and it's obviously going to be recorded on your application. Mm -hmm. Do you consider the second one over, like how the most recent one. The most recent one. Mm -hmm. For a major change, like, and then you do a post back do you look at the previous GPA a lot less extensively because it's a difference? Um, for a major change from like a non science type of a thing? It, it, those, it's it by, it's no, not necessarily. Um, the courses that are recorded for your science GPA are biology, chemistry, physics, and math. 
So everything else is all other. So if it's recorded as an engineering course, it's probably in the all other category. And though we do look at all GPAs, we're, we also have the biology, chemistry, physics, and math, which is your science GPA that we focus on. I, did you have your hand up? Oh, the same question. Same question. OK. Yes, ma'am. I don't believe so. We had somebody last year, I think she was like 18 or 19, that applied. And she interviewed. She was homeschooled, went through college. I mean, huh. scary. Uh huh. Can you explain what you mean when you said the most recent, when you retake an MCAT score, you take the most recent one? That's correct. So you've taken it the first time, you took it January. And then you take it again in June. We take the June score. That's your risk for us. That's what we do. Mm -hmm. So now we've discussed at length academics. We know what you need to do with academics. So let's say you have the strong academics. You got the MCAT, the GPA, blah, blah, blah. We've talked a lot about this. We want to see that you have those research activities. Research doesn't necessarily have to be fruit flies on a bench. It could be something that's a little more interesting to you. I actually had an applicant say, well, I don't really want to work with fruit flies. Well, then don't. It's OK. I wouldn't want to either. We've had students who have matriculated into our program. They've done research in uh, social justice. They've done research in psychology. They've done research in music. It's the process that we want you to have. Certainly, if you're biologically or, chem you know, if you want to do research in those areas, please do so. But there's a number of factors. People who are involved with public health and global health, they love that. There's still research involved in all of those things. Typically, when they do research in those particular fields, they do relate it in some way to medicine, but it doesn't have to necessarily be a fruit fly, bench, wet lab type of a thing. It could be a number of activities. Yes? So the research doesn't specifically have to be related to science? No. No. Because again, if, and then I know that Davis has like, I'm sure they have the Europe, the Research Opportunities Program, um, or like the Bio 199, which is like Irvine, where you take the course and you do the clinical research. Any of those things are great opportunities. We don't require that you publish. It certainly helps if you do. It just is a nice feature, but you don't have to. Time-wise, I would say at least six months of solid activity, because you want to be there for a while. You want to give the commitment, the growth, and, and show that you can do this, because you're going to take leadership positions. You're going to grow within that and you're hoping for a letter of recommendation from the researcher. Clinical activities. Clinical activities are very, very important. So maybe I'm looking at your application and I saw that you did three months of shadowing over this summer and three months of shadowing over that summer, but that's pretty much it. That's probably going to not be the best set of activities for you. So I'm going to suggest to you that you get involved with your community clinic you maybe try to find an opportunity to be a scribe. Does everybody know what doing the scribe is? Is that what you do? That's a great opportunity, and you get paid for it. I'm just saying, you got to eat. It always helps. <laughs> it's a great experience because what it, as a scribe, you get to follow a doctor. You get hands-on, one-on-one experience that you probably won't get as a volunteer in any other capacity. So I highly recommend those opportunities if given. Um, the free clinic. Finding a physician that maybe you can shadow them during their office hours and get in there. Because if the more that they trust you, the more that you work with them, hopefully you maybe can do vitals. You can have a little interaction with the patient. I'm not asking you to cure their diseases. I'm not asking you to diagnose them. I'm asking you to interact with them. And there's a big difference between passively shadowing and actively interacting. Yes? Volunteering with EMT. Very good. Like ambulances. With sure. EMT. Absolutely, that's a good thing. Hospice care, end of life care for people, very good. Because the thing is, all of those types of experiences are going to give you such an eye-opening experience. Pers uh, your personal statement, I guarantee you probably have a story or two that you could tell us that you could write about in your personal statement. It could be your first death. It could be the first baby that you were there when they were delivered. Um, so those type of active experiences give you active experiences, and hopefully they confirm your desire to go into medicine. Okay, Community service, again, it's very important to us that you have community service. So this could be anything that interests you, boys and girls clubs, um, homeless, tutoring, blah, blah, blah. So get, have a well-rounded application. Be a well-rounded person because 
that's what's going to kind of separate you out from the same person who has the same GPA and MCAT score as you. Okay? Any questions about any of that? So when do you reapply? I really don't think, I think it's better in the big picture of things, take the year. Take the year even after, so you apply this year, you don't have to reapply next year right away. Take the time, find out what was missing on your application, fix what was missing on your application, and then reapply. If you know right away, if you know when you will hit submit that you probably wasn't the right time for you to apply, then continue working on that, building that, and reapply the next year. But if you're finding out from me in January, February, March, what was missing on your application, and you're like, well, I'm going to reapply in June, unfortunately, you may end up the same result as you did the previous June when you applied then. So time is, I know everybody sitting in here is thinking, but I'll be 25 when I matriculate, and I'll be this, and I'll be 30 when I graduate, and I'll be 35 when I start practicing. Yes, you will. It's a long haul in medicine. It's a good 8 to 10 years worth of training. You're going to be that anyway. If one year is not going to make that big of a difference in that big scheme of things. So apply when it's the right time. Everything, my phrase, and I say this in every presentation I get, you do it when you're ready. You take the MCAT when you're ready, and you apply when you're ready. And if it's not the right time, you fix it, and you make sure it gets pulled together. Um, have you made the changes? And so what steps have you done to really pull it all together? Okay. A lot of our frequently asked questions, does it hurt your chances to reapply? How does the admissions committee view that? If we can see that you've taken all the steps and you've really grown your application, and it's usually pretty clear because you can see, you put the dates on there of when you're doing activities, we see the letters of recommendation, we see the growth in your academics, we see the new MCAT, whatever it is. That's, I don't even have to pull out your old application to be able to see that. It's all right in front of me. Um, we talked about which MCAT score I use. It's the most current one. And I promise you, I don't hold two applications side by side. I don't do that. It's, uh, there's already 6,000. I can barely get through the ones we have. I'm not going to go back and search for your old one just to kind of compare. It should be evident on that application when you reapply what you fixed and what you've changed. Questions? Concerns? Yes, sir. Like for me, um, I'm currently applying right now, but one of, one of the difficulties I had was getting letters from my professors. Mm -hmm. But since I graduated, it's hard for me to okay. improve those relationships. How would you suggest I deal with that? You're going to have to have letters from some science professors. Um, so maybe you have research that you can pull some research letters from. You have to talk to them. When you're in school, in, at, at Davis or any other school that you go to, but I know like at the UCs when you're in the science courses, you're one of about 200, 300, 400 people. You're probably sat way at the top to sneak in and sneak out. You know, trust me, I got it. So what you need to do, and you're thinking, how is this guy going to know who I am? Because I sit way up there, you know, and I'm a sea of faces of one of 200, 300, 400. So what you need to do is you need to take the time to get to know that professor. Go to office hours, get to know their TA, do whatever you can do to mitigate that. You've already graduated, I presume. You're going to have to try to reestablish some connections, or you're going to have to find alternate letters to help you. Yes? No, but that TA is going to talk to that professor. Because that's their, that TA is their eyes and ears for you. So, yeah. Yes, sir. Um, well, I'm heavy on clinical experience and light on research. Uh, I mean, and I'm also going to be graduating this June. There's just not really enough time to get started doing research. Mm -hmm. What are some ways I can get involved? Do I have to do a post -boc or? No, you can find a job as a research assistant. You can try to get into a lab now. Look at the hospitals to see if they're hiring. Do a volunteer as a research assistant. Um, see if there's an MRAP or a kind of a club that does clinical research here at UC Davis. Are you, are you, are you here? No. Where are you? Uh, CSU so see if there's something there that you can get. Just find a professor or something you can get involved with. And get started because one of the beautiful things now on the AMCAS, one, it's still October. You're graduating when? Uh, in June. Start now 
and work through June. If you continue working, you can put future dates on your application. So that is good. But find something now. Okay. Yes? What about like letters or recommendations from coworkers, like lab managers or like? You want to think about the person writing you the letter. So your TA question, the coworkers probably aren't going to hold as much weight with the admissions committee. Remember, the admissions committee is made up of faculty who are clinicians, who are researchers. They're not going to hold a lot of weight for a lab, like a lab tech or a lab manager or a coworker. I had somebody ask me if they could have their, um, like a, an administrative assistant write a letter. No. Have the boss. Have the next level up. So they should be able, if they have to communicate with the lab, the, the, the PI or somebody to get that letter. You want to have strong letters of recommendation you have from people who know you well but are credible to the admissions committee. Yes, ma'am. So um, as far as letters of recommendations for like science or research, would maybe one of the doctors that I work with, would that be useful? Yes, very much so. So um, letters of rec, so you need the science and the research, but if you've been in a position, how long have you been doing the scribe? So the longer you're in that position, hopefully you'll be in there for a while. Uh, most people who go into medical school and go into scribing, they love it. It's such a fantastic experience. I can't recommend it enough. Um, and you've been there for a long time. Any activity you do for a significant amount of time and you put it down as a significant activity, you probably want to try to get a letter from that. So that's definitely a good option. So does that have to be a professor from school? Because I, I did research with a professor in high school. Would I, could I put her as a letter of recommendation? Um, are you still working with that professor or was it only a high school activity? But it was, was it only during high school? Yeah. That's probably not going to hold a lot of weight. You want to have college experiences. Here and then back. I noticed on some of the applications, they want to have more, so what is the red? Mm -hmm. And then they say they could be from different people. So I'm like, it, they, I heard a lot of people say in the conference they really want relatives from the field you plan on going into. But then they also say you could do it from community people. So, yes. I want all of that. So we recommend three to six. One or two are from science people. One maybe from a researcher that you've had some significant experiences with. Clinical person that you've had some significant experiences with if you've been a volunteer in something. How many athletes? Do I have any athletes in here? A coach would be a good one. Um, a work like a supervisor from your job. So do you know what we're looking for when we get letters of recommendation? What would you think? There it is. What else? Character reference. What else? Teamwork. Work ethic. Can you manage your time? What is her um, characteristics like? Who are you as a person? She's very compassionate. She's very warm. And what is your name? Oh, very nice. So Christina, she, um, she was in my class and she got an A. What does that tell me about Christina? They don't know her. So now I'm going to say, yes, Christina came and talked to me, and she told me about her plans to go to medical school. While she did get an A, and you can see that in her transcripts, and her academics are very good, I also want to tell you about Christina. She's a very warm and compassionate person. And while she was taking a full load at, at Santa Clara University, she also was volunteering two to three hours a week in this place. And she did research with this person. And... She also came from where she's had to work 20 hours a week. So in addition to all that, she maintained her grades and did this. And I can see myself going to Christina as a doctor, as a patient one day. She's very warm and she's very caring and very giving. Do you see where I'm getting with this? I want to get to know Christina. I'm only getting to know you guys through paper. So everything that you put on paper, everything that's written about you on paper, has to give me how fabulous you really are. Otherwise, it's easy to put you aside. Okay. You had a question. You mentioned before about something about a scribe for physicians. How does one look for a, physician, a job position? Go online and do a search position for, like, scribe. There's a couple of corporations, I think, that you could apply under. They're usually ER. They're usually in a hospital. Are fellowships and internships recommended? Sure. If you can do them, like summer, NIH has a lot of different ones. Not right now, maybe, but 
maybe in a six months or something when they get back to work. Go to the websites, go to your school websites, talk to different people. So everything should be on the internet, just do searches. All right, I think if there's no more questions, I think we are just about out of time. All right, thank you so much.